Türwe. This podcast comes to you from the University of Toronto, Mississauga. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the university operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to work on this land, and we strive toward peace and reconciliation among all peoples. Hi, I'm Jill Kasky, Associate Professor of Art History at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. Welcome to Medieval Art Matters, a podcast where we showcase the vitality of contemporary research on the Middle Ages. In each episode, we invite a scholar to talk about critical issues that shaped the experiences of people living long ago and that still matter today. I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Erica Lowick, for a discussion of today's theme, Indigenizing the Museum. Hi, I'm Erica Lowick, Assistant Professor of Global Medieval Art at Florida State University. Today we'll be speaking with art historian, curator, and practicing artist, Dr. Gerald McMaster. He teaches at the Ontario College of Art and Design University in Toronto, where he holds the Canada Research Chair of Indigenous Visual Culture and Curatorial Practice. He has conducted research and organized exhibitions on three continents, from the Venice Biennale to the Biennale of Sydney, and closer to home, the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto, and the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian in Washington. His recent work addresses how Indigenous voices provide new perspectives on the art of the past and present. He is Nahil, Plains Cree, and a citizen of the Siksika First Nation. Welcome, Professor McMaster, and thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you. We're looking at an image on the podcast section of our website, artofthemiddleages.com, of a small Inuit piece. Could you give us a basic sense of the work, where it came from, what it's made of, and what it depicts? Yes, the work is of uh, Kaluna, Inuit called Kaluna. Well, today, probably Southerners, or sometimes they refer to them as white people. It doesn't refer so much to the skin color, as I understand it, so much as the kind of state of mind. Uh, Kabluna, perhaps you might have heard that term referred to. A number of years ago, while I was working at the Canadian Museum of Civilization, now it's called the Canadian Museum of History, working on a major exhibition for the First Peoples Hall, I came across a piece that would signify a kind of shift from an indigenous history to the arrival of Europeans. And this piece came up and I was just blown away by it. And uh, as we talked more about it, I came to find out that it was a piece, a small sculpture, amulet size, because you know, we, of those times would create amulets uh, for people to carry on their clothing. But it was, we found out that it was discovered by an American archeologist, I believe with the Smithsonian, her name is Deborah Zabo, and she discovered this uh, while in the southern part of Baffin Island in the early 70s, 1972. And uh, they dated it to about 1250 to 1300 CE. So we've come to realize it's the earliest extant piece of a representation of our European other. I think we realize and really think that it's probably a Norseman. You know, we think of Vikings, of course, today. This would be the earliest extant uh, piece that, that is around. Now, if we look at it closely, or I have to describe it here, it's a small wooden piece. The figure appears to be wearing a tunic, a uh, hooded tunic, by the way, which is split down the middle. So you can kind of figure that it's a long tunic. And across the chest, there's a, a curious kind of image of the cross, I'm assuming that at this time the Norse were Christianized. Why would they think it's of the Norsemen and of this time period? Well, beside it, Zabo and others discovered chainmail. Of course, chainmail is European and Norse, and all this came together. And a few years ago, I was teaching a class, an Inuit art history class, and I showed this piece. And I had a couple of Inuit students in the class, and one of them says, oh, that's obviously a white guy. And I said, what do you mean, obviously? 
And he said, well, he's tall and skinny. He said, we never picture ourselves that way. We're always like fat and round. You know? Of course, it's the puffy coats, right, that they wore. So that that's, I think, one of the reasons that, that you, we might think that it is that. So that that's the piece. You wanted to show us another piece as well. This is an, an Argelite piece. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yes. Uh, after that first experience of finding, or at least me finding, uh, my interest began to grow in this kind of the reverse gaze we've begun to call it. It's how indigenous peoples were referencing and representing Europeans, because up until now, all history seems to be about the other way, how Europeans, artists, writers, you name it, Hollywood, pictured indigenous peoples. That's the kind of uh, lens in which we saw ourselves through the eyes of the other. Now we're discovering, okay, in the past, there was some attention given to the reverse case, how indigenous peoples of the Americas were picturing Europeans. And so my interest began to move in this new direction. So when I was working with the Archaeology of Ontario from 2005 to 2010, and in preparation for the galleries there, this piece came across uh, from a collector who indicated that there was a piece that saw the bees that was available. And it was this remarkable argillite piece. Uh, that was uh, of a sea captain. We know it's Haida because of the material that it's made from. It's argillite. Only this black argillite is found on Haida Gwaii. And there was a period from about 1830s to 1860s in which Haida artists were representing Europeans in this way. And many of these folks were coming through Haida Gwaii trading. And of course, artists started to trade and and respond to European presence in this very, very interesting way. <clears throat> so this piece was created, we're thinking circa 1840s. Uh, it's a remarkable, beautiful piece, this tall one piece of argillite with a white piece of uh, ivory to indicate the whiteness of the individual. But everything within its posture, its comport, uh, signifies European. It was just this remarkable piece, this absolutely gorgeous piece to show the artistry of Haida artists when they came in contact with Europeans, not just that they were good artists, but I think the material in which they were trading for, such as steel knives, because the knives they traded for enabled them to start carving in intricate detail. So you can see the intricacy in this particular piece, and the observation and watching the other uh, in, as I say, the comport of the individual is really quite remarkable. Both pieces, by the way, if you go to the Museum, Canadian Museum of History or the Archive of Ontario today, you will actually see these uh, on display. So I find it fascinating thinking about pieces like this as capturing this moment in time and the kinds of things that were being exchanged. What else do you think pieces like this tell us about Indigenous settler interactions? Well, it tells us a lot because we've learned certainly through history about the reverse and how Indigenous peoples kind of responding to Europeans in, in particular ways. But I think that when we start to begin thinking about this time period and how scholars are now of the past and able us to look at the material from the past, we begin to see the, the documentation that was occurring and how we've inherited this material and are starting to look at this new material now in different ways. And so we start to see contact from the point of view of relationships between Indigenous and European we start to and begin to see the materials that were extant and traded into indigenous communities as the reverse was true the other way. You also begin to see ideas, inherited ideas, which uh, became part of these communities. And I think that that's the remarkable side that we're only beginning to look at now. And we realize that indigenous peoples of the day were remarkably modern. Unlike today, when I say to unlike today, I say because so many of the cultures across the country have been denied access through the Indian Act, through residential school process, all that, that cultural erasure that was going on. So now you start to look back at this life that once was to say that was a traditional way of life. And so what we pick up today is these traditions and we, we talk about them in very um, 
uh, very important ways, these traditions. But when you think about the folks in the 19th century, yes, they had traditions, but at the same time, they were powerfully influenced by new materials, new ideas, without ever saying that they, uh, that they were losing their culture because language was strong, everything was strong, nothing was being erased as it was during the late 19th and early 20th century. So I think that that's the kind of impact that uh, we see, and then we start looking back today and how we start to see different kinds of people coming into indigenous territories, right? Sailors, missionaries, tourists, settlers, and even anthropologists. Everybody's coming into Indian country and so when we see these artists just mirroring those kind of realities and creating the certain style of art and creating objects, right, for trade, for souvenirs, I think that that was uh, an interesting time in, in the history. Can I just ask you a couple other questions about these two objects? It's so striking how with the Haida sea captain, the face is so meticulously carved and for reasons that you've described and the whiteness of that face is so critical for identifying other aspects of the piece. And yet with the Inuit piece for this amulet, the face seems effaced or non-existent. And I wonder about that. And I wonder for an object functioning potentially as an amulet, what that might mean. That's an interesting question. Now, I, I can't say the kind of, at this point, the, ma the materials that Inuit may have used to, to carve. Maybe they had knives that were traded to them by the Norse. It's hard to say. Unlike the Haida, who had this kind of material access, the articulation is different. Perhaps even maybe some of the earlier pieces, the Inuit weren't showing people's faces because they, there was no reason to. If they picture them in this kind of the comport, the posture, that was probably good enough to express that idea of otherness as opposed to, say, how Haida would have done it. The discipline of art history developed in a really specific European setting, and, and many of its basic premises derive from European contexts and attitudes. So art historians have been wrestling with this legacy, even those of us who study the core of the European canon. So I wonder, like, what methodologies are you developing to deal with, dismantle, or replace settler colonizing ideas? That's a great question. Also, a great moment <laughs> that things are changing, things are shifting. You know, you can almost feel it in the wind just by that question. <laughs> so I'm calling this moment in art history, perhaps, an indigenous turn, because we're feeling it not just only in this country, but internationally as well. So, and it's incumbent upon investigating how the world is both perceived and understood through language and visual knowledge. Here at the Wapata, I'm the director of the Wapata Center for Visual Knowledge at OCAD University. And when I first came, the research question that I was really interested in is what happens when creative cultures come into contact? And I just spoke about those uh, examples in those two pieces. So from these earliest times of contact uh, and trade between Europeans and indigenous peoples, there's a constant shared history from materials to ideas. And as I said, being coeval with Europeans really gave us a sense, an idea that we as indigenous peoples had always been modern up until that time, until that kind of a forced effacement through the Indian Act and almost total annihilation of cultures. In particular, this kind of annihilation of visual culture which I call visual knowledge, not visual culture, but visual knowledge. So at Wapata, we study particular kinds of art produced in these entangled zones, right, of this modernity. And I think that that's what's of interest to us. So this kind of indigenous turn towards uh, researching and situating indigenous ways of knowing in contrast, and I think this is where it gets at your question, in contrast to European theory and methodology is locatable by just a simple naming of the research center, Wapata, because what it does is signifies our shared interest in determining the thrivance and efficacy of indigenous ways of seeing and visual knowledges that are embedded in significant creative practices. So in a sense, Wapata is a condition or a visual knowledge. So indigenous folks in the arts continue to expand the language of art, contributing to the discourse 
of this visual knowledge that remains stubbornly situated within the frameworks of the Western art world. So the Indigenous turn asks that the history of this starting point be reevaluated. So the question here for us, I think, is how, how is that impact? How are we carrying it on? And so one of the simple ways, perhaps, is to say that by going back and looking at Indigenous language, because you and I and Eric are speaking in English, <laughs> art history is taught in English, French, or German. So consequently, we're all going to be seen from those points of view and those perspectives. And I think that an Indigenous art history, similarly, we start to take on the values, the perspectives of the other. So now if we think of reversing that to say, starting from the point of view of Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous language, can we perhaps begin to perceive in every different way? Can we not find new languages, new knowledges that enable us to contribute to art history, Canadian art history, and maybe American art history, but art history in general, because art history, as we've known through time, is extremely malleable and uh, expandable. But, you know, we've lived through time and through my lifetime, how narrow, though, however, that gap has been. And so with the presence of world art histories and other cultures from around the world, we're now slowly seeing that expanding. And I'm not sure how European <laughs> art historians are thinking about this, but I think the influence of indigenous art histories and language and perspectives, as well as others, is only making our discipline far more interesting and exciting. And so I think that that's, that's where we're at today. I'd love to pick up on this idea of the, the Indigenous turn and Indigenous ways of seeing, specifically in the context of museums and exhibitions and where you think this could help to change the future of exhibitions. Maybe, maybe you could tell us a little bit about Time Holds All the Answers. Yes, uh, Time Holds All the Answers is an exhibition I just curated at the Reme Modern in Saskatoon. And the exhibition was uh, an exhibition of an artist collective called Post Commodity. There are two artists, Cade Twist and Cristobal Martinez. And one of the things that we began discussing early on in my two years we're now working with them, and the exhibition is now open, the catalog is at press. But one of the interesting things is that, and it goes to the last question that you just had about how indigenous peoples are contributing perhaps to art history and how is it expanding. But historically, when we think of vectors of movements, you know, and the impact of colonization, whether it's through language, through art history, through other forms, that trajectory, that 500 year trajectory, that colonialist movement really originated in Europe and eventually flowed across the Americas through streams of colonizers, settlers, and art historians. <laughs> so it's this kind of latitudinal flow, something that's further complicated today by time zones. As we know, time zones flow in latitudinally across, across the world, and it organizes our day. So I think this finding aid, uh, this idea was another idea of a different magnitude and we started to try to think differently. Rather than this east-west trajectory, we started to think differently about an indigenousness, about indigeneity, about the Americas, for example. So we started thinking of uh, a longitudinal direction that it should take precedence, that our relations have always flowed north and south. But borders, uh, linguistic borders, English, Spanish, Portuguese have have really cut off those relations, uh, these geopolitical boundaries have really cut us off. So could it be signified and could we reestablish these ancient ties and the movement of indigenous peoples? And so this process is about a reflection of being in relation. And it was about a question of a worldview. So as we started to work together, post-commodity introduced me to this idea called the hemispherical indigeneity. One of the ideas that's currently of interest to me is a global indigeneity. I'm working on another project that opens in the fall of 2022 at the Power Plant in Toronto called the Arctic Amazon. 
So you can see that kind of longitudinal axis, that global indigenous relations that bring together cultures and perhaps a shared interest in each other's worldviews, connected knowledges of indigenous peoples that are rooted here in the Americas and always have been in the Americas. So when we think of these ancient ties, these ancient relations, it has been about trading and exchanging, borrowing. Some would say making babies, of course, <laughs> speaking different languages uh, between indigenous peoples across the Americas. So that is an example, perhaps, of that thinking, forward thinking of uh, a methodology that, that may help us focus more in the indigenous Americas and that contribution can go not just worldwide, but even within this country. As we know, we have universities and colleges that teach only European art history, and we've done this for so many years. So now uh, I think this introduction will, will help change that. In talking about your curatorial work, you're obviously gesturing toward the, the future and some of the major questions that you will be grappling with, North-South indigeneity. In terms of the field of Indigenous visual culture and curatorial practice as a whole, where do you see the field going or where would you like that to go? I think this shift in perception of an indigenous turn can be said to have been anticipated and to some extent shaped by different artistic practices across the globe today. This globalization with so many biennials happening every year, you know, constantly, 150 or more going on almost simultaneously so we can see that, that, that this change is happening across the globe. And, and continues to be defined, uh, art continues to be defined now as we're seeing it in relation to science, politics, philosophy, literature, cultural theory, and, and architecture, just to give you some examples. So within this heightened perceptivity, it, it will be the artist's ability to slip in and out of conventional social customs, common speech, and perceptual boundaries by means of conversations and stories to define their becoming. They must ask new questions and old questions in perhaps in novel ways. That, and that's the way that I'm seeing this move today. Thank you so much, Professor McMaster. It's been fascinating speaking to you today. We're very grateful for the time that you spent with us. Thank you very much and have a good day. That was Professor Gerald McMaster of the Ontario College of Art and Design University in Toronto on indigenizing art history and the museum. You've been listening to an episode of Medieval Art Matters, hosted by Erica Loek and me, Jill Kasky. Medieval Art Matters complements the book written by Jill Kasky, Adam Cohen, and Linda Safran called Art and Architecture of the Middle Ages, Exploring a Connected World. It is published by Cornell University Press. For more information, go to the website that accompanies the book, artofthemiddleages.com, where you'll also find more podcasts in this series. Medieval Art Matters is made possible by the support of the Department of Art History at the University of Toronto St. George Campus and the Office of the Vice Principal and Dean, University of Toronto Mississauga. Many thanks to the Toronto Consort for providing the music. This podcast was brought to you by Cited Media Productions, Thanks for listening. You have been listening to a Cited Media production. C-I-D-E-D. Find out more at sidedmedia.ca.